Good morning. It is uh, a great privilege for me to be able to be here um, to speak to you. I'd, I'd like to start out, uh, if you take the evalu evaluation sheets out of your uh, um, folder and um, under co any one of the comments, just write keynote, outstanding, spectacular, <laughs> wonderful, I swooned, um, the miracle was incredible. So, no, uh, you can... <laughs> All right, you can finish it on the other side, as Marissa says. Um, it, is, uh, it is really a privilege to be able to be a part of, of this uh, eTools uh, presentation um, that you're experiencing today, um, and perhaps um, even more so as, as I've, uh, uh, you know, journeyed through my priesthood and journeyed through the church, um, I've come to see, um, and I hope that you will come to see, and, and if your mere presence here uh, sort of indicates that the most important thing that we can do is evangelize. Um, and that's even a mistake to say that. It's not the most important thing we do. It's who we are. It's who we are. That's what church and being church means. When I was uh, in the seminary, um, I took a class uh, in an elective, a history elective, called The Church in New Jersey. And Monsignor, I don't know if any of you know Monsignor Ray Kupke, he taught the course. And, uh, and part of the course was obviously in the classroom, where you were in the classroom actually doing, uh, you know, studies and he was doing lectures. But part of it was also he would take you around to different churches in the Archdiocese and the Diocese of Patterson, elsewhere, and he would um, have us go into the church, take a look around, and just observe. Look at the church, look at the statues, look at the altar, look at everything. Just, he'd give us like 10, 15 minutes just to walk around and look and see. And then he'd gather us all together in the front pews, uh, all the students in the front pews, and he would always ask the same question with each church that we visited. And he would ask this question, it has forever haunted me. Every church I ever go into, that's the question that jumps into my mind. And basically the question is, what does this church tell you about the people who built it? Think about that with your own churches. Think about that when you go into other churches. Hopefully I've poisoned you now, and you will go into every church thinking, what does this church tell me about the people who built it? And sometimes it was just very, very simple. We would say, oh, it was a, a Polish community, an Irish community, that you could tell by the statuary. Or you could say something as simple as, it was a big community. And if any of you have looked around uh, here in the archdiocese and even beyond, we have a lot of big churches, don't we? We have some huge, huge churches. And so those churches, what they tell us about the people who built it was that they were big. They were many. Because they weren't necessarily having any kind of foresight in terms of what they were envisioning. They were building a church big enough for the community that came to worship. And so it wasn't like they were being magnanimous. It wasn't like they were being generous. They wanted to accommodate the community that came together and worshiped and prayed and gave thanks to God. And so they had to build it that big. So they did. And they made them big. And what do we notice now? We notice a lot of empty pews. We notice a lot of space. We notice, maybe not on Christmas, maybe not on Easter, but certainly we notice it perhaps during the week. And that's kind of a trend that has been ongoing for the last 20, 30 years. And we see that in just the mere statistics that we have in the archdiocese, because we ask our pastors to report numbers in two different times of the year, in October and in March. And the trend is down in every single parish, going down by an average of anywhere from 12 to 20 percent. 12 to 20 percent. And in some cases, when you get a real difficult pastor, it's even more. No, I can't blame the pastor. That's not right. That's not fair. But, um, and, and you know what? The reasons for this are many. And it's not my intention at this point, and it's not our intention to get into the reasons for that. 
uh, because they are many, they're complex, they're interplaying with each other, um, and it's, uh, but it's disconcerting, isn't it? And now uh, I've been traveling around with the Cardinal as he's made his deanery visits throughout the archdiocese, and one of the um, uh, repetitive questions that comes up in each of the places that we go, um, that, that, that he goes, um, is how can we get people back into the pews? Specifically, how can we get young people back into the pews? How can we do this? Because it is discouraging. And he makes a simple point, a simple point that all of you have moved toward and have come to understand. And he says this point, he says, they're not coming to us. Right? They're not coming to us. So we've got to go to them. They're not coming to us, so we've got to go to them. And so I want to focus in this keynote as you, you prepare for your workshops on the, on the different ways that evangelization is working. I want to focus on what Pope Francis has told us about evangelization about the new evangelization. Popes have been talking to us about the new evangelization since John Paul II. Popes have been talking to us even before then about evangelization and the importance of the evangelization. Not the evangelization of hundreds of years ago when we went around the world or even the evangelization of thousands of years ago when we went around proclaiming Jesus to those who didn't know it. This is a reproclamation. This is a reproclamation. And the first person who coined the phrase about the new evangelization was John Paul II. Benedict carried it through. And we've heard over the last 30 years a lot about what they've said about the new evangelization, the importance of the new evangelization. And, so, and Pope Francis has continued that trend. And yet he has put his own particular hallmark, his own particular imprint on that evangelization. And that's what I want to focus on today in this particular keynote. He says things that have been said by other popes. And he says things that are important for us to understand. Um, and I think that's, um, and, and again, he's put his own little, 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 um, not little, a big imprint on it. And, uh, and this is this, this new evangelization um, that, that we're all engaged in, that we're all seeking to, um, to accomplish. One, uh, one time back when I was the vice rector of the seminary, um, the... Uh, Scott Hahn, I don't know if many of you are familiar with Scott Hahn, he came and gave one, a lecture, one of the Garrity lectures at the seminary, and we did it at the Lady of Sorrows in South Orange. And, um, and he gave a talk, the, the church was packed. It was packed, uh, I remember I was sitting up in the choir loft, it was so crowded. Uh, and he was talking, and his whole talk was on evangelization. Evangelization is uh, John Paul II, evangelization from you know, what it means, this new evangelization. And uh, I can remember coming back to the seminary and having formation sessions with the seminarians, and they didn't like it. And I thought to myself, they didn't like it. I said, well, what didn't you like about it? What, what was that? And their basic comment was, ah, it's just another program. We don't need another program. And I was kind of stunned, and I thought to myself, another program? It's not another program. It's not even the fabric and fiber of being a Catholic or being a disciple. It is who we are. That's what it means to be church. It means to be evangelizing. And that's where um, Pope Francis starts, like all his predecessors started, with those theological foundations, those ecclesial foundations of evangelization. That's where he starts. And what most of what, we, what he says about evangelization, can you guess where we find it? We find it in his encyclical, The Joy of the Gospel, Evangelii Gaudium. However, it's important to keep in mind that in his other encyclicals, apostolic exhortations, in his bulls, they do have papal bulls. I never liked that word. <laughs> because it's like, you know, it's more bull from the Pope. You know, so it's like, okay, so we have the, the, but that theme of evangelization, as he understands it, is woven through the entire, and even in, we see it in Laudate Si, 
We see it in uh, the other, other things that he's written. And he starts basically where the others start and walks us through. He says, evangelization takes place in obedience to the missionary mandate of Jesus. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. I was quite encouraged by the fact that that was kind of where he started because it was that very passage from Matthew's Gospel that I put on my ordination prayer card from Matthew 28. Go and baptize all nations in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But Francis left off the line that made me put it on my card in the first place. And know that I am with you until the end of time. Know that I am with you to the end of the world. He didn't put it in the, in the encyclical. He left it off. And I was like, why did he do that? What was that? Behold, I am with you always until the end of the age or the end of time. In these 25 years that I've been journeying in the priesthood um, and, and, and experiencing in the different ways, as, as Father John pointed out, um, as important as that concept is that Jesus is with us always until the end of time, what becomes more important, really, even than that, as important as that is, because that is foundational, that we've got to do something about it. We've got to do something about it. We've got to act on that. That's the missionary mandate. He says, The Word of God constantly shows us how God challenges those who believe in Him to go forth. Those who believe in Him to go forth. That's always the command. And that's the command we find throughout Scripture. And then Francis goes into a whole exposition of those who were told to go forth. My favorite was Abraham. My favorite was Abraham. But he brings up Abraham. He brings up Moses. He brings up Jeremiah. And all of them that he brings up, with the exception of Abraham, all of them made excuses not to go forth. They all had an excuse. Every one of them had an excuse, except Abraham. Moses. What was Moses' excuse? Of that he said he couldn't go forth. He couldn't talk. He had some kind of a speech impediment. So what does God say to him? God says to him, okay, well, we'll let him do your talking for you. But you're the leader. You go forth. What was Jeremiah's excuse? I'm too young. I'm too young. I kind of felt that way when I was first ordained, when the people at my first parish thought I was the oldest mass server. And as I was standing there preaching at a weekday mass, and I was preaching to people whose lives more than doubled my own and who had wisdom to teach me. And so we could use those same excuses, but Jeremiah was too young. And then basically God's response to Jeremiah is, well, who do you think you are? You're not given your message. You're given mine. So shut up and get out there and talk. Isaiah, what was Isaiah's excuse? Anyone remember what Isaiah's excuse? Think of Peter when I'm a sinner. He says, I'm a sinner. I can't. I can't because I'm so bad. I'm so evil. I'm so unworthy. Similar to what Peter said when, when, he, when he went and was called by the Lord to be a fisher of men. He says, I'm a sinner. So how does God deal with that? Takes a piece of charcoal, cleanses him. The only one the only one that went out was Abraham, without an excuse, without a question. And the thing about Abraham is that he didn't know where he was going. He didn't know what he was doing. The Lord just said, go. And Abraham was old. He packed up his family, he packed up his flocks, he packed everything up and just went. I don't think I even would have known where to go. East, west, north, south. But this is what the missionary mandate has been as we see it from the very beginning of Scripture, from the very beginning of Genesis. And it carries through the countless, countless people who were called to go forth. 
And of course, they go forth eventually. One of the things that is perhaps the single most hallmark of Francis' approach to evangelization is the whole idea of the joy, the joy of the gospel, the joy of the gospel. And that joy needs to enliven, he says, the community of disciples with that missionary joy. And then he points out, think of the 72 disciples who went out, who he sent out two by two, and what happened when they came back? They were rejoicing. They were thrilled. They were beyond thrilled. They saw Satan falling from the sky. They saw all these great things. They cured people. They expelled demons. They did all these things. And they came back rejoicing. And Jesus asked them to give an account. And he allows them to give an account. But what does he say to them? Don't rejoice so much that you saw Satan falling from the sky. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. But this, this joy this joy that was experienced, the joy that was experienced by the disciples, by the apostles, who uh, upon Jesus' resurrection were cowering in the darkness of an upper room and then burst out because of that coming of the Holy Spirit into the world with great joy and great enthusiasm. It's that kind of joy, that joy of the gospel, that he perhaps makes his own. That we have to be happy we have to be happy and be joyful because that's what the message of the gospel gives us. Francis says that the church's closeness to Jesus is part of a common journey. And he says, and he points out how communion and mission, communion and mission are profoundly interconnected. Communion, where the church comes together as a community, as a community of faith and seeks solace seeks encouragement, seeks support from one another. But then at the same time is also that same community that then goes forth, that then goes out on mission. And fidelity to the example of Jesus himself. He says it is vitally important for the church today to go forth and preach the gospel to all, to all places on all occasions, without hesitation, reluctance, or fear. The joy of the gospel is for all people. No one is to be excluded. And that's what drives it. You and I, in one way, shape, or form, have experienced the joy of the gospel. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. But there's a heck of a lot of more people out there that need to experience the joy of the gospel. And they're not coming to us, so we've got to go out to them. Francis says the, per the church goes forth as a community of missionary disciples. Another distinctive piece of Francis's concept of evangelization, a community of missionary disciples who take the first step, who are involved and supportive, who bear fruit and rejoice. An evangelizing community knows that the Lord has taken the initiative, he has loved us first, and therefore we can move forward, boldly take the initiative, go out to others, seek those who have fallen away, stand at the crossroads, and welcome the outcast. Go out to them. But here's the thing. As, as, as he, after he says that, he draws certain conclusions that he tells us. And he basically says, so let us try a little harder to take the first step to become involved. And then he goes through a whole list of things. He says, an evangelizing community gets involved by word and deed in people's daily lives. Evangelizers, evangelizers just take on the smell of the sheep. You've all heard that. The evangelizers take on the smell of the sheep, and the sheep are willing to hear the voice. Note that the, the, the Francis is talking to the church. He's talking to you and me. He's not just talking to father. He's not just talking to sister. He's talking to all of us. He says an evangelizing community is also supportive, standing by people at every step of the way, no matter how difficult or lengthy this may prove to be. And he says, finally, an evangelizing community is filled with joy. Now note what he's talking about. When we think about evangelization, and when we talk about evangelization, we think often enough, I would think, that we're evangelizing, right? Right? 
I'm going to go out and evangelize. I'm going to go out and bang on doors and confront people, right? That's the Catholic concept of evangelization, right? You're all going to go out and bang on doors and you're going to go, you're going to get that soapbox and you're going to go into the middle of Times Square and you're going to stand on it and proclaim the gospel. You're going to do that. He's not talking about that here. He's talking about an evangelizing community, not individuals. He's talking about evangelizing communities. And that's what the community, the church, it's who we are. It's not who I am. We've got to be the ones. It's a community effort. It's a group effort. It's not just me. And then he brings it down to the core, the core point of the issue. Evangelization is the task of the church. The church, as an agent of evangelization, is more than an organic and hierarchical institution. She is first and foremost a people advancing <coughs> on its pilgrim way toward God. She is certainly a mystery rooted in the Trinity, <coughs> yet she exists concretely in history as a people of pilgrims and evangelizers, transcending any institutional expression, however necessary. A journey. We're not in one place at one time. Each one of us is on a journey, and we as a community of faith is on a journey. That's the whole idea of the scriptures as we journey through life, as we journey to go forward. We're on a journey as a community of faith, as a community of people. What, what he's calling for is what he, what he calls a permanent state of mission. A permanent state of mission, and not just administration called and he calls it the missionary option. See, we've all gotten used to administration, administration of our parishes, administrations of our communities. We as priests have done that too. And sometimes we live and sometimes we dwell in another age, another time. We sometimes still think that we're in the 1950s or the 1960s, where the, chew, the pews were filled and people were coming, and there was very little that we had to do to get them to come. Well, that's not where we're at right now. That's not who we are right now. That's not what's happening right now. And so we have got to make this re-envision re, re and re-embrace this permanent state of mission, this missionary option. He says, a missionary impulse capable, and this is it, this is, this is his too, of transforming everything. So that the church customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation. We don't need to, as, they've, as we've heard so often, we don't need to hunker down. We don't need to to become enclosed in our, in our churches. We need to go out. We need to get, you know, get a move on. You know, it's like that, uh, that when Moses is, is sitting there in the burning bush and God is talking to him, and, and what is basically, what is God saying to him? Is he's basically saying, as, as Stephen King once said in a book called The Stand, he said, stop beating around this here bush and get out there and do your work. Do the missionary impulse. And, but we've, we've sometimes shifted and become so focused on administration, preservation, and not going out. And that's something that we as communities of faith, clergy and laity and religious alike, have to be transformed. Because once we're transformed, then we can transform everybody else. But Francis says that the parish is not an outdated institution. Obviously, he's responding to something. He's responding to maybe those detractors who say that the parish is outdated or it's not serving its purpose. Well, it's not serving its purpose because it's not evangelizing, not just as another program, but as who we are, what we are, what makes us who we are. Paul VI told us that what makes the church the church is the evangelization. As to, and Paul VI went so far as to say that when we're not evangelizing, we cease to be church. 
So the parish, he says, is not an outdated, Francis says, is not an outdated institution. He says the parish is the presence of the church in a given territory, an environment for hearing God's word, for growth in the Christian life, for dialogue, for proclamation, for charitable outreach, for worship and celebration. Is that your parishes? It may not match, but that's what he says the parish is all about. It's not outdated. These are the things that the parish needs to do. In all its activities, he says, the parish encourages and trains its members to be evangelizers. So it's not like we have the Rosary Society over here and the Holy Name over here and the evangelizers over here. It's not like we have the youth group over here and the Eucharistic ministers over here and the lectors over here and the evangelizers over here. No, that evangelization, that mandate, that missionary mandate has to permeate everything. It's not another program. It is who we are. And pastoral ministry, he says, and a missionary key seeks to abandon the complacent attitude that says, we have always done it that way. How many times have you heard that? What if you had a dollar for every time you heard, we've always done it that way? We'd have a lot of rich people in the room, wouldn't we? We've always done it that way. Francis says we have to, that's a complacent attitude. We've always done it that way. He says, I invite everyone to be bold and creative. Be bold and creative in the task of rethinking the goals, structure, style, and methods of evangelization in their respective communities. Today, you're going to get three. But there's millions out there. There's millions of ways that we can do this and that we can create it and that we can accomplish it. He says, pastoral ministry is a missionary style, is not obsessed. This is something that, that Francis has said over and over again in many different places. Is pastoral ministry in a missionary style is not obsessed with disjointed transmission of a multitude of doctrines to be insistently imposed. Sometimes that's what we think it is, right? Get the doctrines across, get this across, blah, 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 get this and this issue and that issue and that issue. He says the task of evangelization operates within the limits and language of circumstances, in a context, in the ordinary lives of people. He says it certainly seeks to communicate more effectively the truth of the gospel in a specific context without renouncing the truth, the goodness and the light which it can bring wherever perfection is possible. Now, he acknowledges here and then uh, at this particular point, and then later he'll acknowledge the same thing, that we cannot be discouraged. Because many of us can be discouraged with where we find ourselves. And I think perhaps you wouldn't be here if you weren't in some way, shape, or form discouraged with the direction and the trajectory that we're taking. So he says, you cannot be discouraged. He says, why can't you be discouraged? He says, the joy of the gospel is such that it cannot be taken away from us by anyone or anything. It cannot be taken away from us. And refuse to allow it to be taken away from you. Refuse to allow it to be taken away in any way, shape, or form. Francis says, the evils of the world, and he says, and those of the church, must not be excuses for diminishing our commitment and our fervor. Let us look upon them as challenges which can help us to grow. With the eyes of faith, we can see the light which the Holy Spirit always radiates in the midst of darkness, never forgetting that where sin increased, grace has abounded all the more. Don't let it be a discouragement. Persevere. How many times do we hear that in the Scriptures, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament? Persevere. Continue on the journey. The journey is what makes us one. He says one of the more serious temptations which stifles boldness and zeal, and that's what evangelization requires. It requires boldness, courage, and zeal, passion. He says one of the more serious temptations which stifles boldness and zeal is a defeatism which turns us into querul uh, querulous and disillusioned pessimists. Do we have any querulous and disillusioned pessimists in the room? He calls them, <laughs> we have one, we have one. He calls them sourpusses. That's what the word in the encyclical is. They're sourpusses. How many sourpusses have you seen in the church when you go to church sometimes? I know sometimes I can, like when I'm preaching at a, at a mass and I'm, and I'm preaching and, you know, people are looking at you like, you know, like you're, 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 you're going to like, uh, you know, do something really bad to them. 
You know, and, and where I really, really notice is when people are coming up to communion and they look like they're going to die. <laughs> I, like, I purposely like, try to smile big. I mean, you're coming up to receive the living God. You should be happy. This is something happy. Now, I know sometimes people mix up pious with happy and they're being pious and they don't mean to be, but sometimes it can be very, very, but, but those sour pusses, how many of you have seen those sour pusses? One of the things that, um, in his, in his, uh, in his talks, Cardinal Tobin has said, uh, you know, at a very, I've heard him say it many times is he said, when he read that in the, in the encyclical, and I don't know, many of you may have heard him say this, when you read that, and it, it was actually the word he used, it was sour pusses. And he says, uh, he, Cardinal says, I, I wanted to know what word he actually used, you know, because he probably didn't write it in English, but English translated to sour pussy. So he went back to the Spanish and he read the Spanish. The Cardinal read the Spanish, which was, I guess, what he wrote it in. He probably wrote it in Spanish. And you know how, how it's said in Spanish? He said, he always points out vinegar face. <laughs> that's a sour puss. A sour puss is a vinegar face. And that's what he actually, that's what the Pope says. He says about pessimists or sourpusses. He says, nobody can go off to battle unless he is fully convinced of the victory beforehand. If we start without confidence, we have already lost half the battle and we bury our talents. While painfully aware of our own frailties, we have to march on without giving in, keeping in mind that the Lord said to St. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Don't be discouraged. Keep on marching. Keep on walking. He then goes back to the whole idea about the community. And he calls it a fraternal community. He says, I especially ask Christians and communities throughout the world to offer a radiant and attractive witness of fraternal communion. Let everyone admire how you care for one another and how you encourage and accompany one another. Accompany one another. That's key in Francis. And that's key that we'll find it here, and we'll find it uh, also particularly in, uh, in um, uh, one of his other, in La Date Si. We'll see that. Accompany. Accompany one another. Okay? By every, uh, and, and he quotes John, he says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. They'll know we are Christians by our love. This was Jesus' heartfelt prayer to the Father, that they will all be one in us so that the world may believe. So he goes into the foundational part of saying we've got to be a, a fraternal community, supporting one another, loving one another, working together, not seeing another as threat, not seeing another as, as, as judgment, but to be a community, a community of faith. So then he gives us some concrete ways in which we can do evangelization some concrete ways that he can do evangelization. And while they're concrete ways, they're rather broad. Basically, when it comes to evangelization, anywhere and with anyone. Anywhere and with anyone. That's what he says. Today, as the church seeks to experience a profound missionary renewal, there's a kind of preaching which falls to each of us as a daily responsibility. It has to do with bringing the gospel to the people we meet, whether they be our neighbor or complete strangers. This is, quote, informal preaching, which takes place in the middle of a conversation, something along the lines of what a missionary does when visiting a home. Being a disciple means being constantly ready to bring the love of Jesus to others. And this can happen unexpectedly and in any place, on the street, in the city square, during work, on a journey, anywhere, anywhere, anytime. And it takes a kind of a sensitivity on us as, in this case, individuals, to be in tune when we encounter the people who are crying out for help, who are hurting, who are lost, who are in darkness, who are looking for meaning, who are looking for blessing, who are looking for God. That's, you know, we got to learn to be able to seize those opportunities. And that means we have to continually be aware of it so that we can bring it up when we're at the lunch table, when we're in the office, when we're at school, wherever we find ourselves, people will cry out for help in one way, shape, or form. And we've got to seize those moments that evangelization can take place anywhere and with anyone. Second concrete things he says we can do is in gentle dialogue. 
He says, gentle in dialogue. So in that, in that particular case, it's probably not good for us to go to our children and say, why the hell aren't you going to church? <laughs> go to church. I don't know why you gave up your faith. I don't know why you don't believe in God. You know, sometimes we can be very, very aggressive in that way. But he talks about gentle in dialogue. In this preaching, see, when, when you're doing this, when you're doing it anywhere with anyone, it's the informal preaching. And in that informal preaching, in this preaching, he says, which is always respectful and gentle. The first step is personal dialogue. Talking to people. When the other person speaks and shares his or her joys, hopes, and concerns of loved ones or so many other heartfelt needs, only afterwards is it possible to bring up God's word, perhaps by reading a Bible verse or relating a story, but always keeping in mind the fundamental message, the personal love of God who became man, who gave himself up for us, who is living and who offers his salvation and his friendship. You'd be amazed what that can do gentle and respectful in dialogue. It reminds me of a time when I was was home and um, for Christmas, I was with my family, and we got into this discussion about faith um, and and morals and and God and Jesus and all things like that. We were talking about it. Now, please, don't make no mistake, the Nidegger family aren't a bunch of pious people. We have the same kind of uh, tawdry conversations that you have in many families. So this was kind of unusual. But I remember we got into a, a discussion about it, and it led to the whole point of, of was there ever a time that, you, that Jesus or God spoke to you? And I remember because, I mean, there, there was a moment, a, 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 fu- a fundamental and a foundational moment in my life when I heard that message. I had that encounter with God. I had that encounter with Jesus. And I'm sure you have had it too. When this was my encounter, I was in high school. I was on a retreat. And uh, the priest had just given a talk entitled Encountering God in Jesus Christ. And it was in the late afternoon on a Saturday. We were up in Slotesburg, New York, in this big, huge mansion with windows facing out into, the, into, the, into the, the hillside. And the sun was just beginning to set. It was almost like that road to Emmaus kind of a thing. And I remember sitting there, and he had finished giving the talk. And in the front of the podium where he was, there was a picture of the surfer Jesus. I don't know if you ever saw that, the surfer Jesus right there. And there was a candle next to it. And I remember sitting there just, you know, uh, I guess they say crisscross applesauce now. They, you can't say that other word. So I'm sitting there, I remember looking up and I'm just, I just was staring at Jesus' face. And I was just staring at his face and I just I had heard the words. And, and this is a story I'm telling to my family, to my, to, specifically to my sister. And I, I remember looking up there and saying, and then all of a sudden, All of a sudden, as clearly as I'm talking to you right now, I heard Jesus say, I love you. I heard him say it. I don't say that often because people might think I'm hearing voices. And I don't want them to think I'm nuts. But I really did. It was really an incredible, incredible, a life-changing moment. A life-changing encounter in which that, as the Pope said, that the Lord, the, the Lord of the universe said to me, I love you. That was all. Nothing more. Nothing less. No, no explanation. And it was profound. And I remember as I was telling this story, my sister was fascinated by it. My sister was fascinated by it. And, uh, and, uh, and she said, uh, and, and she just was glued to it. And she said, okay, that's, that's something. It's this whole idea of, of this encounter. And that's where it comes to. You have all had that encounter with Christ in one way, shape, or form. That's what we, that's what fuels our zeal, fuels our passion, fuels our conviction, fuels what we are and who we are. And that is what we need to bring to our evangelization so that when we go out, we can enable others to experience that same thing. That same thing. To be able to really, really uh, do that in a gentle, in a dialogical way, accompanying people where they need to be and what they need to do. There's a lot more that Francis says. And if I had a couple more hours, uh, I would be able to share all of that with you. But this is a start. 
this is a start. Um, you know, there's, uh, I didn't get to all the material that I had, but that's okay because I'll use it somewhere else. I think I'll, I'll use it tomorrow in South Orange, so get ready for a repeat. But, but, but that's, that, that's just the beginning and it gets us thinking. Um, uh, you know, but I think that that's, and that's where, ultimately that's where Francis will end. He says, we need to bring the encounter that we've had with Christ to others in a gentle, dialogical way that really, really imparts to them the love of God, the love of the Savior, the love of the Redeemer. And so I hope this, I, I, I didn't see any women swooning. I didn't see any. I'll look at Father John, he's going to pass out. Uh, there were no miracles, there was no swooning, but it was great to be able to be here with you. I'm, uh, if you want to hear part two of this talk, then we'll, we'll arrange a time to do it. But thank you so much, it was great to be here with you.